Hello. Hello, everyone. This is Tiffany with the Private Room and founder of BBP Project Safe Haven. Um, tonight, we had to switch over to completely virtual um, because of some health things that were going on with me. So I'm very, very happy that we were able to still have this event tonight. So tonight, we are going to be listening to several survivors, this Irish Jean Benton, as well as Mr. Sean Smart, as well as Nuff Said, myself, and Nicole Williams. We also have some live performances by John A. Wright, Ms. Conscious Johnny First, and Erica Meadows. So I hope that you will tune in tonight to support our survivors who are sharing their stories of triumph and how they are thriving right now and what they are doing for their community. And I also hope that you will tune in to support our performers tonight who believe in raising awareness as well as we do as survivors. But these are also artists and performers that also support the cause of raising domestic, the domestic violence awareness in our communities. So we are going to be or starting right away. And I have with me right now my co-host who looks like he's talking to himself. <laughs> So we have our co-host, Mr. Nuff said he is on tonight, and um, he is going to be introducing our first performer tonight, but right now, I want to make sure that everybody's tuned in. Please make sure you get comfortable. We are going to be here from 7 to 9 tonight, listening to our survivors and tuning in for some live entertainment. I also want to let you know about BBP Project Safe Haven Emergency Fund. Right now, we are collecting do donations for the emergency fund to provide emergency shelter for victims of domestic violence and their families. Along with the shelter fund, we will also be providing clothing, toiletries, excuse me, clothing, toiletries, and also case management. So from the point of referral all the way up until our victims who are now going to be survivors because they have left their abusive relationship, we are going to be helping them throughout the whole process from referral until they are in a safe house, housing environment. So we need you. We need you, whether it is an individual donation or if you want to become a sponsor. The sponsorships start at $25 for individuals, $50 for businesses. But we're asking that you donate whatever it is that you can. So you can go to the link that I'm about to drop in the comments, which is prdbevent.eventbrite.com. Again, that's prdbevent.eventbrite.com. We need you to help us help the community. Victims, one of their number one concerns leaving an abusive relationship is not knowing where they're going to go. And that's because they've been isolated from their families because of their abusers. They are most likely reliant on their abuser. And so they don't know where their next move is going to be. Leaving your abuser can be very, very scary when you don't know where to go or you don't have family to go to or friends to go to. So we are trying to change that dynamic. It is the number one reason why a um, victims stay with their abusers, and it's the number one resource that victims need when they do leave their abusers. We need to close that gap because shelters are always full, including the DV shelters. We want to, to be able to supply and to be able to meet the demand of victims fleeing from their abusive relationships and their abusive homes. So, please make sure that you follow the link prdbevent.eventprice.com to donate any amount because any amount counts. Right now, I am going to introduce you to my co-host and my partner in the community, Nuff Said. Nuff Said, it is all yours right now. <laughs> hey, what's good, baby? So glad to be a part of this Dope, dope podcast. So honored to be your co-host. And I am so honored to be talking about a real-life issue today, tonight. Domestic violence is really, really crazy in our community. It's crazy in our society as a whole. And not only that, 
I personally feel the root portion of it is mental health. We've got to deal with mental health. Real talk. There's a lot of people out here living crazy. Real talk. That's both ways. So with that being said, I'm super excited to be here. I personally am a domestic violence survivor. I was married to a woman that beat the Carolina brakes off of me, baby. I mean that. She meant that thing, too. I made her mad. I, I, did, I, I must admit, I did push this woman. I pushed her to, I didn't physically push her. Don't get it twisted. I don't look like, look, 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 look that I got. I ain't touch her. I was leaving. And she said, Cedrice, you about to leave me? And I said, yes. I, and matter of fact, I ain't say nothing. Oh, God is my witness. I ain't say a word. I was saying it in myself. Yes, I am. I'm tired of this. And I grabbed my belongings and I'm about to get out of that door. <laughs> Whoa, that's your heart. Yes, sir. That woman turned into Crouching Tiger, hit a Negro. She jumped up between the canvas, came through. She came upside my. She beat me from the bedroom to the front door. From the front door back to the bedroom because I forgot my cell phone in the closet. <laughs> to be mocha. But nevertheless, I survived. When the police got there, I told her she's going to jail tonight. Jesus, she's going to jail tonight. But then the police got there. Let's say, Mr. Brown, we see you bruise up and you bleeding there from your shoulder. She bit me. And then they say, um, you want to press charges? I said, no, nah, man. At this point, that lady in there, she a single mother. Her kids, they need her. And I'm good. I got my stuff. We good. And that's how we ended it. And, you know, I can laugh about it now. And we both can, but the truth of the matter, that was a crazy situation. She later apologized, and in that situation, I was willing to accept her apology because I was also gone. You understand what I'm talking about? So when people come to apology, the best apology I was going to be changing behavior, first of all. Second of all, uh, love don't hurt people. People hurt people. And third of all, you put your hands on me, you are pretty much telling me you don't really love me like you say you do. So with that being said, that's why I backed up. That's why I moved out. And that's why now we're friends. She married again. She happy. I'm married again. We happy. Ain't no problems at all. Now I got this story to sell and make money off of. You know what I'm talking about? I was there laughing my pain. I, swear, I was in a lot of pain. Like for seven days, I was swollen and everything. Ooh. Anyway, we're here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We're here, we're here to talk about a real situation. And all jokes aside, my situation was real. And at that time, I wasn't laughing about anything. It was a very serious and traumatic experience because in my mind, the whole time I kept saying to myself, what did I do to make a person want to like assault me? Like what? I did not hit you. I did not put my hands in. So what, what in your mind made you say, okay, this is the point where I'm going to put my hands on. I didn't understand. I really didn't. I hadn't been in a relationship like that ever before. And I was the first and the last one. And I learned from it, you know, so learn your lesson. Well, it's what it's really all about. That's what it came down for me, but I have no problem opening my coat being transparent. Revelation said they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and word of their testimonies. And what that means, ladies and gentlemen, is simply this, your testimony, what you've gone through, what you're going through, that can very well be someone else's release, someone else's outlet, including your own. So I say that to say this, you get in a car, you get in a promotion, you get in all this. That's not your testimony. Your testimony is actually how you almost died and you made it through how you were disobedient. How you just kept doing the wrong thing or hanging with the wrong, want to connect it to the wrong one you refuse to let it go and it almost cost you your life or it cost you some sanity peace patience family who knows whatever it costs you that's your testimony and that's the part that we're here to talk about tonight Tim, you ready to have a good time with this man i'm ready i'm ready, I'm very, excellent. I'm very ready. <laughs> excellent me too me too so who we got coming up first we have John A. Oh, man. You know what, John A? I am so glad. I saw that, too. I've been so busy in my lineup. I know I got some people. I know one or two people said they weren't going to be able to make it. If I'm not mistaken, they'd be late. I'm not sure. But I do know I saw John A's name, and I was super excited. The reason why I'm excited about John A, because when we did our last podcast, she came out and told us about her real-life traumatic experience. And I was really blown away. And, you know, if you don't know, John A is definitely a force to be reckoned with in the, the the straight community as well as the lgbtq community in more ways than one so with that being said is she ready to pull up on us yep yep Excellent. Right ladies and gentlemen as i present to some and introduce to others one of the illest that ever did this super dope super phenomenal dip with my dope friend at the same same time y'all make some noise for ja Nail. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? Love it, love it, love it, love it. <laughs> How are you? So glad to have you here. Uh, uh, 
There she is. There she is. Hey, what's good, man? So glad to have you here. Hey. How, how you feeling? I'm feeling good. Is there an echo? I hear echo. You say you do? I don't know. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So we wanted to, we thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And my first question is going to obviously be what everybody wants to know. One, uh, who do your hair? Who do my hair? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have a designated, designated but, but um, recently, recently done my job. Akeem, Alton, from Miami. That's what I knew. It was something expensive. I, whatever it was, I just knew it was expensive. That's what, I knew it was expensive. Whatever it was, I knew it was expensive, and that's what I wanted to start with because see, I know that black women, sisters, queens, y'all all particular about hair, about your look, your beauty, your appearance, which is part of the reason why we had to do this domestic violence. We believe, yeah, beauty's on the skin deep, but there's another portion of beauty inside the heart, inside of the soul that's often beat up, that's often assaulted, that's often damaged, that's often that often go through blows that honestly take longer to heal than even the skin. So we wanted to talk about that tonight, and we certainly wanted to hear your point of view, your testimony, whatever you're willing to share with us on the topic. Okay. Okay. Well Johnny, we have Johnny, a little bit of, um, um, I don't know if you have more than one, more than one more device, device going. Okay, what about, okay, what about now? Oh, uh, where are you? What about now? It's still echoing. Is it me? Is it me? Yes. Yeah. I got, I put my headset on. Okay, there you go. Is it better? Yep, that's much better. Okay, okay. So um, we were uh, we left off on the topic. What was the topic? Did you want me to elaborate on? I wanted you to talk about domestic violence. That's what we're talking about tonight. And what I was saying was right, that right. We, we, I asked you about your hair because I know women, queens, you all are really particular about your appearance. And what I was saying is through domestic violence, we always can find ourselves to find loved ones in situations where they've been beaten and they use makeup to beautify to cover the scars. But inside there's some there's some scars that happen it take longer some of them never even heal but i wanted you to talk about that from the perspective i know how much time and money you spend in your hair your makeup and everything but just to think that you would have to spend that much money or much more money just to beautify yourself over the abuses from the domestic violence so with that being said i just wanted you to speak on that uh from that angle of that perspective whatever you had to share in regards to it um i think, um, I think I think, I think. Um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And also, I also think that um, there, there's different types of healing that especially women, Black women specifically, we deal with emotionally, spiritually, and physically, you know? And um, the things that I can relate to um, on an emotional level, deep down inside, um, outside of, of the physicality, Yes, I spend a lot in cosmetics. <laughs> Not that I have to, but I do because of the line of work that I do and modeling and stuff. So I'm very knowledgeable about different things and, and my vanity and, you know, my hair, hair products, hair care, beauty, you know. Um, and, you know, everywhere I go, like me and um, my friend, we was at the mall today and this guy was like, you look like a model. She is a model. <laughs> so, it was very funny. And then he was bringing up this Victoria's Secret model that, you know, he thought that um, I looked like. Um, um, but I just, I just feel that, that uh, it's, very it's very imperative, imperative for, for women to, to uh, uh, invest, invest in their, in their personal, personal life, personal life, life when it comes down to how they how present, they present themselves, themselves and how they show up in the world. 
Um, um, me, personally, me personally, I feel that, that I have to I take time, time for myself, myself and have some healthy, healthy selfishness for, for me to, me to uh, be, be mentally sane. Because there's a lot of things, things that are going on. There's a lot of things that people think that, think that you should do and how, how you should be and how you should, how you should show, show up. up. Um, um, but it's, it's very, very important to know who you are inside. And if you don't Find that you're gonna have, you're gonna a, have difficult a difficult time, time you know, you know uh, understanding, understanding who you really are inside. So, so um, I think that's, I think that's my message. message. Um, um, but, but outside, outside of that, of that um, um, how have you? I mean, not cutting you off. People always said, I cut you off, but they cut you off. So, cutting you off and not cutting you off with a disrespectful way, should I say? Uh, have, you ever, have you ever found yourself in a situation? Because you just said, um, like, knowing who you are, and you talked about how uh, knowing exactly what you want out of life, so to speak. And have you ever had, or had known how you want to move, how you want to maneuver? Have you ever had a situation where someone wanted you to maneuver a certain way? Like, uh, have you been in a relationship, for instance, where someone has said, look, I need you to do this or not do that. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I know what you'd like to do, but this is what I need you to do. You ever done anything like that? You ever experienced anything like that? Uh, um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think um, um, People, People always, always will refer to a relationship, to a relationship type of, type of uh, thing, thing, but, but I, think I think it's also in family ships. You can be, you can, you can, you, you can be, uh, have, family have family members that think that you're supposed, supposed to be a doctor, to be a doctor or, 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 or a lawyer or, 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 whatever, or whatever they think that the family standard is. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. What I'm asking, I'm asking in regards to, since we're talking about domestic violence, I'm speaking in terms of a relationship. Like, have you ever found yourself in a relationship where who you are as a person or your character or the way you like to do things, say, for instance, you like to wear long hair and the person preferred short hair. Have you ever been in a situation where those type of demands have been placed in you to create that type of domestic violence, domestic violent type situation or relationship? Um, maybe, um, maybe not, not to, to the extreme, extreme but, but very, very uh, um, I had an experience where I felt like, like I was uh, being, uh, being micromanaged um, in, um, in the relationship, relationship okay. on, on like things had to, had to be a certain way. way. Maybe, maybe not, not physically, physically being, being, you know, you know attacked in a relationship, in a relationship um, um, but, but more like, more like there's, different there's different ways it could be vulnerable or just little certain things feeling that you're um, enclosed, enclosed into a box and you can't really be yourself. Um, and um, you're and really just being a reflection of what the other person thinks you're supposed to be or what they want to see you do. And, and it's and not it's really not, you. Yeah. I got you. All right, so I, I got you. Yeah, I, I, I get. I need to go with that. That was. And that, um, I don't. I don't know. Um, 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 I think if you're not talking, maybe you should mute um, your mic. Maybe that. Maybe that will help. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So let me see if this does. Because I, because I, it was working, and then it came back. The lag when I, when I start talking, okay. it came back. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. So you're not now. So I'm, I'm not sure what's going on, but anyway, um, you made a really good point okay. that um, you know, when people put those demands on you and they start to micromanage you then that can start to be a sign. That is one of the signs of yeah. a person that is potentially has the characteristics for becoming abusive, mm -hmm. whether it's just emotionally or mentally, um, being, telling you where to go, telling you what's dressed, and what you do, and what's going on. All of those things All of this are things that you are- Okay, now it's, it's, coming, it's back coming back. Coming back. Yeah. yeah, that can potentially lead to domestic violence. I know that you were going to perform for us tonight. So are you ready to do that? Okay. Yes, ma'am. You, you ready? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. ready. <laughs> all right. All, all right. right. Jenny, it, the floor is all yours. DJ, you got my song.
Do you have someone playing your music for you, Jenna? Oh, girl, I thought she was playing it, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> no, girl. no, they didn't have it. Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, yeah, we will come back to you. We'll come back to you, Johnny. Um, So, okay. enough said, we have a full panel tonight. Yeah, we have a full panel tonight. Oh, so, 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 we have Miss P, who is going to be performing tonight. Miss P is also known as the producer and the and we're going to go ahead and Nicole. Hello, Nicole. Hey, sis. Hey. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. 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 We've got a lot of interviews. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So for Miss Nicole, Miss Nicole is AKA Doll Lady Laureate. She is a survivor, actor, author, poet. She's a founder of Board Colazette, which is a DV organization. She's president of the Elite Dolls of Faith, Queen City Dolls Charlotte Chapter. She's also God's God, baby you and you into Love Unspoken and Depths of Solitude, all of it available on Amazon.com. So, Miss Nicole, tell us your story, and we are here. We're ready to listen. Well, um, whew, well, my story is all in my poem, beginning, the middle, and the ending. You know, I was married to a man, you know, growing up in up in the New York. I was very independent, and um. I met this man and he broke that independence down. And so I married him. I had my, my three sons and it took from the years of abuse after five years and three boys, not wanting my children, especially boys to know that this is the way to treat a woman. I got out. So when you say you got out, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like you were, was it just you that was getting out or did you feel like you were getting your boys out too? I felt like I, felt like I was getting, I was getting, getting my son out, out too. Because, because you know, you know, as as a, a, I grew up in a two parent home, you know, and um, I felt that this is not any way that boys should see that a man, how a man treats their mother because i remember one mother's day um after midnight he beat me fought me tore the house up after i cooked the whole dinner meal threw it in the trash almost practically killed me and then all he did was got up that morning while i was sitting there crying cleaning up the kitchen and took my three sons out all day long on mother's day and and so what kind of message are you sending to your children the mother that had them, that gave birth to them, that went through so much trauma. So I needed to get out for the sake of that. And that's actually, that's what made me get out because of them. That's a good point. That's a good a lot point. Of a lot of survivors. Um, get out of, get out of their relationships because of their children. Because of their children. I know I think I know where Tiff is going. I want to speak her thought, but I will say this. I was in a situation and I witnessed that firsthand mm -hmm. to where if she had not gotten out, her kids could have very well either died in that situation. And when I see 
abusive boyfriends kill the kids and then the later the mama helping look for them and all of that stuff is just it just bring it back to that same story of the person my loved one and so i'm just i just look and i hear your story and i can immediately as you're talking i can hear your boys i can identify from that angle on how they felt about that Yes. yes. Meaning and the I, freedom, the liberty, the, li- the liberation from you leaving. That's why I asked it, you know, specifically because when when I talked to the young man, he said to me, um, I, I was his counselor, and he said to me, he says, um, Mr. Brown, when my mom left and she left for good, I knew because I saw it in her eyes, and I felt like when she broke free from him, she broke both of us free because I thought he was going to kill both of us. And like it wasn't, he didn't use big words. He wasn't trying to be dramatic, but I felt that young man's soul when he spoke those words to me. So that's why when you start telling your story, I could see, you know, I could see that. And it was the same way where he wasn't any good and he was this, he was that, and she was whatever. But as long as he was angry at the boy, she could take it. See, but when he, you know, it got to the point where it got, um, it got physical with the boy, then she could no longer take it. She could take the verbal stuff because she said that's just his way of trying to discipline you, is what she was saying. I was, I was a counselor, and I'm telling him, ma'am, mm-hmm. this ain't gonna be, this not gonna work. I was fearful of them being in that situation growing, and then one of the boys possibly killing him. Mm-hmm. So, wow, <laughs> what a story! And, and you, know, you, you have plans about this. I, yeah, yeah. Because, because I kind of was worried about, about if my sons son get, get older, older if they would turn on that and do that. that same you know, and you know, and actually, actually, my middle, my middle son, son, when, when he started in the middle of the day, he fought him because, because, him because of all that he had fought and what he went through. Went through. I wasn't worried about them for sale. I was worried about that. What they would go and, and do, and do. because right. he never, he never them, them. them, but he, all, but he it all, was all always was. me. It was always me. And then when I threatened, well, I'm going to take them. He would always take them, feeling that that was the hold to keep me home, because he know he knew that I would never leave my boys. So that's how he controlled me with them. So when we finally left, I understand what the um the young man said. My mother drove me from South Carolina to New York to relocate. And I remember crossing over the South Carolina border into North Carolina, and I started just bust out crying. My mother looked at me and said, I know you don't miss him already. And I said, no, I'm crying because I was free. It was a sense of freedom. It was like a relief that was all for me. You know, that, that God just lifted so much weight off my shoulder. You know, and I didn't realize I had that much in me to even leave, but I did. And when I did, it was freedom. Yeah, I can definitely understand that. Um, For me, um, having to leave my relationship that I was in, I had little, little ones. Um, So I was able to thankfully get out before they saw the fighting and the pushing and so forth and so on. But I was able to get out of the relationship before um, they were able to see the effects of, of what was going on in the house. Mm-hmm. Um, so for you, I know that your sons are very, very supportive of you and the work that you do. Um, so tell us, how did you become an advocate in the community? What what made you decide to take that extra step? Well, everything I went through, I always wrote it on paper. That was my way of releasing because people have a way of judging you. They don't know your story. They don't. They think they know what they, who you are, but they don't really truly know. So I remember when uh, after I left him, I was stricken with rheumatoid arthritis, and so I was here. I went to New York, got this big job. Oh, I don't need child support. I could take care of my three sons by myself. And boom, God sat me down. Because I remember saying that, um, God, you get me out of this. Whatever it is that you want me to do, I will do. But I reneged on what I was supposed to do. I went ahead. I didn't even go back to church. I was just raising my children. I, the money was right. Everything. We, we had a place. Boom. I was just, just working hard just for, to get us back together. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't work for six years. 
So all mm. the poetry I kept writing. And I remember going to the library and this young man, he kept trying to convince me, why don't you share your poem? No, 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 no. And one day I got up on an um, open mic and I shared my domestic violence poem. And this woman who happened to have three little children reminded me of myself with my three boys. And she came to me and asked me, do you have that on paper? And I was like, no. And she <laughs> said, that's my story. Your story was my story. And that is when I became an advocate. And then I said, okay, God, you funny. You was trying <laughs> to remind me that there was other people that needed to hear my story and want mm -hmm. to know how I got out. And so right. I, I, that's when, so it's been like 20 years now. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Amazing. W would you like to share your poem with us today? Yes. And um, <laughs> before I share it, I always have to put my disclaimer out because um, the tune came from Alicia Keys, A Woman's Worth. I didn't know what it meant years ago when God gave it to me, but now I know. Thank you. You can buy me diamonds. You can buy me pearls. Take me on the cruise around the world. But just don't hit your girl. You can buy me diamonds. You can buy me pearls. Take me on a cruise around the world. But just don't hit your girl. He said, girl, I love you. I am going to make you my wife. I can't see myself being without you in my life. Fall into the trap, but should we come strong too fast? Thinking that this newfound relationship was just destined to last. Charming me, loving me, captivating me with his smile, but not realizing his captivity is what he would do to me after a while. See, after the honeymoon was over, then jealousy stepped in. No matter how much I secluded myself, I just couldn't win. Claiming that his blood, sweat, and tears is what it took to raise our family, but not realizing that those blood, sweat, and tears would be coming for me. Girl, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do it. I won't do it again, as he took from me more and more each day as he tried to get in between. God, he said he loved me. He didn't have to ask me to be his wife. I would have did anything for him at any time. He said, girl, I love you. You are my wife. But if you ever leave me, I will take your life. You can buy me diamonds. You can buy me pearls. Take me on a cruise around the world, but just don't hit your girl. He said, girl, I love you. I am going to make you my wife. I can't see myself being without you in my life. Think about my past, wonder if he'd be the same as the last. How would I know if I don't give him a chance? Wow. He said he loved me. He had to ask me to be his wife. If it was me, him, and a million men, I'd say yes to him any time. Two of a kind, hearts intertwined, combined to death to us, part rich or poor. Even if I leave this earth before him, I'll still come in his dreams wanting him some more. He said, girl, I love you. Thank you for being my wife. I said, God, I love you. Thank you for saving my life. You can buy me diamonds. You can buy me pearls. Take me on a cruise around the world. But just don't hit your girl. Just don't hit your girl. Yes. I, I don't know what it is about this poem otherwise than it's you that's reciting it. But every single time you, um, you do that poem, I hear a different part of it that I didn't hear before. <laughs> um, so... For, for this poem, is this the one that you recited that night that the young lady said that you were um, reciting her story? Is this the poem? Yes. Um, this poem came about too. Like when I was in Jersey at this time, my brother had bought a house for us. He said, I'm going to buy this house. You already here. Me and my sons, I heard my sons upstairs playing in the room. I was sitting on the recliner and I kept hearing that tune. And it kept coming. I didn't even listen to, I really wasn't listening to Alicia Keys or nothing. It's just mm -hmm. this tune. And all of a sudden, I just started writing. And it was like a piece was off because my boys was laughing and playing. Mm -hmm. I was in my own room and reclining. Nobody was beating me up. Nobody wasn't doing nothing. And, you know, and it took me all these years to recognize the meaning of that song itself, A Woman's Worth. 
to really recognize because after you leave the abuse, you go through insecurities, you go through not trusting people, you go through so many different changes. You always had looking over your shoulders, you always wondering what to say, what not to say. And I finally understand why God gave me that tune because He wants to remind me later on about my true worth. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. And you are worth so much, and I love you to death. Um, tell us too. about <laughs> tell us about your new organization. Well, it's called Devora Closet Inc. The ink, as you hear, I say is blood, sweat, and tears. That's why mm -hmm. I called it I N K. Because the ink was my blood, sweat, and tears. When he was beating me, claiming that was his blood, sweat, and tears, I was pouring my pain out on paper. And so Devorah Closet, because I'm such a poet, is a play on words for Devorah Closet. That's what God had given me, and I had to think about it. Devorah was a prophetess. She was a judge. And Closet is, you know, we all say we have skeletons in our closet. You know, and all of us do. And sometimes we got to clean out that closet. So we got to recognize, we got to see, as in the, the, the Bora, and we got to clean that closet out. And only then and then will we be set free. And so the more I share my story, the more I tell my bad, the more every little layers of skin comes off and I'm free. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Um, you also are part of God's Gift Baby Ministry. Tell us about them. Yes, God's Gift Baby Ministry, who's the founder, is Belinda Houston, who's also my regional, senior regional doll agent for Elite Dolls of Faith. And what we do is we give out baby clothes, baby diapers. We're um, 211 people calls from 211, the community. We find community events to try to go ahead and, you know, bless these women and children. And I'm so passionate about God's Gift Baby Ministry with um, Belinda because... I know when I came out of my relationship, we had nothing. We started from scratch and it took a whole community and church to help raise me and my boys up to where I am today. And even though my boys are in three different states, I still pay it forward because that's my way of paying back to God. Say, God, you took care of us. Let me take care of your people. So that's what we do. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know that um, I have uh, given ZZ's clothes to you guys every time yes. she grows out of them. Y'all yes. are the first people that I call because I, I believe in what you're doing and being a single mother for eight years. Um, I understand this, the struggle of um, getting out of an abusive relationship and then being, you know, a single mom, even though, um, you know, their father was in their life, but getting out of an abusive relationship and then, you know, just not wanting to be bothered with dating and all that kind of stuff because I needed to build myself up first. Yes. Um, yes. But it was a struggle. It was a struggle. And so having God's gift um, babies ministry out there, you know, providing uh, infant clothing, um, car seats, cribs, yes. campers, yes. all that good stuff. I know that y'all are doing a lot in the community mm -hmm. because the need is so great. It is so great. Yes. <sighs> Wow. Well, thank you so much, Miss Nicole. I hope that you will stay on with us as we talk to our remaining survivors and that you will listen in to um, our uh, performances that are going to be going on. And you did an impromptu performance. Like, you didn't know you were going to do that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at the time you did. And I appreciate you, Tiffany. Thank you for having me. And say, and don't forget to talk about this weekend, Saturday. Yep. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Do the plug. Do the plug. So Saturday, um, this is my second annual. Everybody asks for Purple and Pearls. But this year, I'm excited that we are going to be part of the Black Family Reunion lineup. Um, follow, I mean, with the breakfast, the emoji breakfast, and then um, the uh, Domestic Violence March. And then our event is one to five inside. And Miss Tiffany is one of my speakers. So I have some <laughs> awesome, awesome female speakers. This year I call it Essence. So, um, you know, I have Angela Thomas Smith, the author, Carla Wise, Louisa, uh, uh, Faith, Cindy. Um, I'm awesome. And the three time cancer survivor 
and domestic violence survivor. She's my keynote, and that's Miss Yolanda Jackson. So I'm excited. And DJ Morning Glory is my DJ, my female DJ. So Saturday, October 15th. That's amazing. Um, go to www.bfrclt.com. You can see the whole lineup. And our event, Purple and Pearl, starts at 1 to 5 inside. So I can't wait. I'm excited. Black Family Reunion yes. Charlotte. Mm-hmm. I am very, very, very excited. Tell them where they can get tickets. Um, and also, she is uh, accepting donations of um, feminine hygiene products. So even if you can't attend, please reach out to myself or Nicole if you would like to donate the hygiene products. Or you can come to the event and drop them off. Just reach out mm-hmm. to myself or Miss Nicole. Tell everybody where they can get tickets at. Oh, uh, They could even go on, on Eventbrite at Purple and Pearls. Or go to www.bfrclt.com. You'll see the lineup. If you want the Purple Pros tickets, you click register and it'll take you straight to the event, right? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Miss Nicole. Please stay on Thank with you. us. And, yes, I will. And Thank enjoy you. the rest of the panel. We appreciate yeah. you. Thank you, Seth. Enough said. All right. <laughs> All right, um, Miss Janae, is she still on there? Let's see if she's ready to go. Do, do, do. Enough said. Um, I would really like for you to talk about the importance of men being um, uh, advocates in the community because I really think it's important that the men out there know that we really do need to have our men out in the community trying to make a difference, being community leaders, especially when it comes to domestic violence. Um, we know from your story that men can be victims too. So I would just like for you to talk briefly about how important it is for men to be advocates and especially when it comes to um, reducing domestic violence. You are on. You are me. on me. There you go. You're on mute, babe. We can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, now. we can hear you uh, now. Excellent. So it's imperative that men speak up. It's imperative that men not be a part of the problem. I mean, that's just that's just it. Um, I speak from a standpoint of if you're a man and you find yourself in a domestic situation, um, leave. I mean, another situation or whatever. And if it's you, if you the problem, then get help. I mean, you got to get help, period. And there's you no know, such thing as she made me do it. She made me mad. Um, and certainly don't allow nobody to pull you out of character. That's my thing. I'm I'm always upset with myself more than anybody else when I allow somebody to pull me out of my character. So that's the first thing. Um, toxic relationships are just that toxic. Some people thrive off of those things. But I uh, love to hurt people. People hurt people. As far as a man, we take our stance as men because ultimately it's our daughter that will be subject to the same thing, used to the same thing, subject to the same thing. And it's, it's, that's what they'll feel. That's what they feel. Um, that's how love will be real to them. That's, that's real love to them. And it's so sad. It's so sad. But again, like I said earlier in the show, it's mental health. It all goes back to mental health. So I don't think it's gender based. I think it's men, women, boy, girl, whoever. If if you know someone in a situation like that, do your best to be the solution or to get a solution or be a part of a solution. That's just my. I mean, and the dog, who Lassie, whoever can tell or get help, please do because there's lives at, at stake, and it's, it all stems from mental health. Because there's no other reason why a person want to put their hands and assault somebody. Um, based on who they are, how they, what they say, what they do, how they look, that's that's mental health. That's just really mental health. So that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> I definitely agree. I definitely agree. Um, um, when I, when I'm going back I, on mute. Uh oh. 
There we go. <laughs> um, I definitely agree with you. When I'm out in the community, um, that's one of the things that I like to impress upon when I'm speaking to people about domestic violence is that domestic violence and becoming a survivor of domestic violence starts with your mental health. Um, once you decide that you are worth more than what you're going through, once you know that you deserve better, once you know that there is a better life out there for you, once you know that the relationship that you're in is not one of love, but of control, then you are able to start working on getting out of that relationship. And it starts with your mental. So thank you for bringing that um, to light, enough said, because it's really important that people and they have to change your mindset and you have to know that you deserve better and that you and your family. So even if it's not just for you, at least do it for your children. If you have children in the home, do do it for your family to get them out of that situation. Because like you said earlier, if children grow in that environment and they're either going to do one or two things, they're also going to adult. All right, so I just got word that Tiffany is frozen. She's getting situated. So, ladies and gentlemen, we thank y'all so much for tuning in. We got a lot of acts. I don't have access to none of them, but nevertheless, we're going to be right here. Like I said, I believe love is a beautiful thing. It's a tool. It's a, po it's a power tool. Love is a power And when I tell you it's a power tool, it'll get anything started, keep anything together, and make anything better. I just believe love like that. So, when it comes down to domestic violence, I believe that's the one thing that it really lacks is love. I'm talking about true, pure love. Love, because they love to hurt people. People hurt people, baby. That's for real. Love. Love is a verb. It's full of action. Every time you see love, every time you catch your love, love is just being that. Love. Child, oh my. Boy, you know, that made me think of the record. Let me see if we can play the record one time. Why we wait for Tiffany to come back? You know what I'm talking about? Let's see, love. I said, whoa, 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 that's a good one right there. Too. We ain't gonna do that. Let's see if we can get this love. Now, I just, oh, that should go right there. Hey, Tim, I was just telling my people, man, about love. We were talking about love and just talking about love to hurt people. People hurt people. And I wanted to play my song. You got the people's ready in the queue. Oh, there we go. The people ready. Lord, they got, oh, that's a nice little setup right there. Somebody don't decorate their whole house. <laughs> I know that's right, Pepe. Tell them. So we are so glad to have y'all here. Of course, we're working out the kinks on everything we need to do. But we're going to have a good time. And I want to share this record with y'all right here. I want to pull this up. There it is right there. Yes, sir. No. Play my... What? You already know what it is. It I'm trying to tell you. Oh, we're talking about love. But I love I... It. That's it. 
Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I ain't got to play it no more. John A here the same. Go ahead and sing. Different. Oh, ever, ever. 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 the first moment I spoke your name, on and on and I knew that by you being in my life, Things for destined to change Cause of love So many people use your name Bang Love how, how, What's the word go? I don't know the word <laughs> Bang Love For better <laughs> I tried, I tried. Uh, through all the ups and downs. Uh, 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 for better words, I still will choose you first. Oh, there we go. We back. We back. Excellent, John A. So at this time, we've been waiting for y'all. I'm about to pull music soul child up on the screen and play it and all that stuff. And you can't write in with it. So we appreciate you. Now, this time, we're going to release the flow so you can do your set and do what it is you do in honor of our domestic violence, ladies and gentlemen. Please put your fingers together for John A. <laughs> y'all this song is all about you you are the queen let me back up a little bit you are the queen you are the queen and for my gentlemen you are a king and this is for everybody definitely the women keep your head up this song is out for you y'all make sure y'all go ahead and download it it's called queen queen of the city it is to be every boy every girl Nikki, Eva Carson, Queen B, you see, and even me. Who's the queen? How about we? Lock to the city and you got the keys. But first, you gotta put pride in yourself. Don't let nobody tell you about nobody else. You the king or the queen. You ain't gotta be me. Just pull up for the seat and you know what I mean. Go ahead and put a smile on your face. Don't never give up. This is you. Be a dream. You got the queen. Ah! Janae, the Egyptian goddess, is on iTunes, it's on Spotify, it's on Apple Music, it's on Tidal, it's on all major platforms called Queen by Janae, the Egyptian goddess. Listen, everybody, I know that we go through a lot in life. We have relationships, that things happen, 
you know, and I just want everybody to stay encouraged and be encouraged and lift your head up. Man, woman, child, everybody, be encouraged. And listen, you're the queen and you're the king. And stay control. Okay? This is cool. <laughs> I want everybody to see. Hold on, let me see if I could. We see it. Thank you so much, Ms. John A. Thank you for coming on and sharing your talents with us. Um, we really appreciate you and supporting us as an artist during Domestic Violence Awareness Month and also here on the, the uh, private room with Tiffany. Um, next, we have Miss Irish Benton. Miss Irish Benton is going to come on and she is going to um, talk to us and share her story with us as well. I um, know when I first became a um, an advocate in the community, a lot of that had to do with Miss Irish Jean Fenton. Um, she was very motiv um, motivational for me, very inspirational for me. Um, she talked to me about you know her story, and she shared her book with me as well. She was actually one of the first. Um, public speaking events that I was able to do was with her. Um, Miss Benton is an author. She is um, an advocate. She's a public speaker. She's a minister. She is all of those amazing things. So um, Miss Benton is on with us tonight, and I am so honored to have her. I've uh, shared platforms with her before, um, and always make sure when I do something related to domestic violence that we have her on. Um, she is an eight-year survivor of domestic violence. Um, she's been advocating for against domestic violence um, since she, her first novel, Breaking His Silence, in 2016. Irish um, began her nonprofit, Diva Nation, in 2018, which is how I met her. She's also a member of the Speakers Bureau with the Mecklenburg County Support Services, a member of the North Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence. She is a 2020 graduate of Grace Biblical Institute and Seminary with an associate's degree in Bible studies. She won the 2017 Queen City Awards Author of the Year. She was also a nominee this year for the Author of the Year Queen City Awards. She won the 2019 Gospel Image Award for Outstanding Community Service Work Against Domestic Violence. And she Irish, can you hear me? I can hear you. You froze for a moment and disappeared, but you are back and I can hear you. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. So you didn't hear anything I just said, did you? <laughs> it's okay. I know my bio. <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Well, the floor is yours, Diva. Thank you so much. I see that Mr. E uh, Nuff said, I want to call him Enough, but Nuff said it. <laughs> also disappeared on us. He's gone incognito. Um, but nevertheless, I am just so excited to hear uh, men on the platform tonight and sharing their testimonies of overcoming. I think that is very, very, very um, empowering to the domestic violence community. Uh, something that he said that men should speak up and not be a part of the problem. I want to applaud him. We really should applaud him tonight, guests and audience. Uh, for being uh, real about the ugly truth. So listen, I know I only have 10 minutes and to all of the other people that are on the platform tonight, congratulations to all of you that have not only survived, but have overcome. We are overcomers. We are bigger and more than surviving. Surviving is one thing, but when you overcome it, it means that you now have tools and resources that you are now able to give to your family and give to your communities for them to not only survive as you did or we did, but to also overcome. So I understand we have 10 minutes, but listen, I have shared my story numerous times. The bio is just part of what I've done, but I've been able to speak in front of 
churches and businesses and also um, shared platforms with Miss Tiffany Brown um, through one of the domestic violence shelters in Charlotte, North Carolina. So Tiffany, I thank you for giving me that opportunity to go and stand before those women um, in their time of need and in certainties of uh, uncertainties of life. Um, while I have shared my story, uh, I wanted to come to the platform tonight in a different mode. I know it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month and that's what I wanna bring to the forefront. I want to bring the awareness aspect. My story is my story. If you want to know more about me and my story, please go to Amazon to grab uh, Breaking His Silence with my first novel. Um, and it is my true story, testament and survival uh, story of surviving domestic violence. And then um, I have Dear God, It's Me, Jean. Um, and then just recently, like September recently, um, I just uh, released my fourth book titled So You Survived the Toxic Relationships. Congratulations. Now what? Seven things that you should be doing to recreate a healthier you. And so I wanted to come in light of that tonight. While we share our stories, people are listening. There are people right now that are in the trenches of domestic violence. What does that mean? There are people right now that are in the darkness of the ugly truth of domestic violence. There are people wanting to know, how do I get out? How do I survive? How do I do this? These are, this is the information we want to put out tonight. Number one, um, if you are currently in a domestic violent, toxic relationship, the number one thing you must do is you must acknowledge, you must acknowledge that you are in a toxic, violent relationship. That is the first thing. The second thing you must do is you must be willing to get help. You must be willing to seek help. No one can do that. We can all share our stories tonight and that's all wonderful. We want to hear these stories. But if you are that person tonight that is on this platform or you will be recapping because you needed information, we want you to know that help is available. There is a national domestic violence hotline that you can call right now, 1-800-799-SAFE, S-A-F-E, 1-800-799-SAFE. If you do not feel safe calling, you can text. Um, there is also a new hotline number for, uh, 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 enough said, enough said, mentioned it tonight. One of the biggest culprits of domestic violence is mental health. There is now help where you can call a three digit number, 988, if you are suffering from mental health, if you know someone that's suffering from mental health, if you yourself, are thinking about suicide, thinking about ending it all, you're having all of these thoughts and you're, you're just not sure where you need to go. 988 is a safe number for you to dial or text and someone is available 24 seven. So I do have a story to share. I am an eight year survivor, uh, survivor of domestic violence. And one of the things that I know is that I never had a platform like this. I didn't have information what people are getting now and tonight. I didn't have resources what people um, have access to now. My violence began in 1999-2000. And ironically, after joining the North Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence, I learned that in 2000, 2000 is when the North Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence excuse me, against domestic violence began collecting data of murdered victims in uh, the state of North Carolina. So uh, you can go to www.NorthCarolinaCoalitionAgainstDomesticViolence.org and this is public information that you can, you can gather. They also have resources available for you. They also have um, uh, content that you can use for your organization, um, for your family. There's content there um, that will give you guidelines on what to do, who to call, when you should call, all of that information is available. But regarding 
me and what I'm doing now in the community is I'm still advocating. I am still a passionate advocate for domestic violence. That is why I wrote this book because I want it to be a guide. I want it to be a tool for someone that has come out. The title is So You Survive the Toxic Relationship. Congratulations, now what? So I wanted people, this is what I want you to do. I want you to put your mindset into someone who has been imprisoned for a number of years, okay? When you've been imprisoned for a number of years, what happens is your mind is now uh, adapting or cohering to the prison system. You now have a prison system mindset. There are rules, there are regulations, uh, there are stipulations, uh, there is no freedom. Someone is controlling every single move you make in the prison system. And it is the same way when you finally think or finally know that you are ready to leave a toxic relationship, a, a domestic violent relationship, you got to get your mind right. Because upon leaving, you still have a prison mindset. And so what happens is if you have not been reformed, what they would call in prison, some people go to prison and they get in, uh, reformed. Some people don't. Uh, some people get reformed temporary. Some people don't. But what happens when you come out of that prison system and you go through those gates, you now are at a crossroads. You don't know to go left. You don't know to go right. You don't know to go forward. And sometimes your mindset is to go back. Some people leave the prison system with the mentality, I know I'll be back. Think about that. How many people have been released from prison but not reformed and they end up back in the system? It's the same way with a victim of domestic violence. If you don't get reformed, if you don't get the proper help, if you don't get the proper process to healing, the information that you need, you'll end up back because that's where you're most comfortable. That is what is familiar to you. I believe Tiffany said earlier that a lot of people are codependent on their abuser. They are reliant on their abuser. So they don't know what to do without the abuse, abuser because they've been uh, conditioned and customized to this particular situation in person. So I now have written a book that I'm giving you guidelines. I'm giving you seven principles that you must do to overcome, not just survive. So you can survive and still deal with it because you just know how to survive it. But I want you to not just survive it, but to overcome it. The first thing you have to do, I mentioned, you got to acknowledge that you are in a toxic relationship and there is a problem there. The second thing is the first thing you wanna do is you wanna begin healing. How does the healing process look? What is that about? You've got to deal with you first. You've got to deal with your past. You've got to start dealing with, why did I end up there? How did I end up there? See, it's bigger than the abuser and I'm not victim blaming. That's one of the things I want to say. I'm not a victim blamer. But this is the ugly truth. This is what this is called tonight. Tonight, the ugly truth about domestic violence. We have to begin dealing with us eternal, internally. Y'all forgive me because I don't know why I'm nervous. And I've been doing this too long. <laughs> um, we have to start dealing with our inner child. We have to start dealing with things that have traumatized us, that have taunted us. Because the reality is, if you really think about it, Nobody wants to be with someone who hurts them. Nobody wants to be with someone who controls them. That is really not what we desire. But then you have to ask yourself, well, how do I end up in these relationships? That's inner work that has to be done. Work, the work has to be done in your healing process. That's why I'm here. This is why Tiffany is here. This is why Nicole is here. This is why the other people that are on the platform is because they had to do the work. Nobody was holding our hands. Thank God for support system. Thank God that we had people praying for us. But ultimately, 
The victim has to make the decision. The victim has to have the willpower. Hear me, the willpower to want to come out and stay out. We can talk to you, we can tell our story, but how bad do you want to get out? How bad do you really want this information is what matters. And how bad you want it will determine what you're willing to do to get it. And that's what I had to do. So if anybody asked me, how did I get out? I had to, I had to want to get out. I had people talking to me. I don't know what's going on with my camera, but it's jumping. <laughs> can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, it's flashing. I don't know if it's doing that. On, okay, it stopped. But you know, um, but what I'm saying is the ultimate decision will come from the person who wants it bad enough. Seven principles. Let's deal with our mental health. I'm so glad uh, Nuff said, mentioned that. That is the culprit. That is one of the culprits to domestic violence, mental health issue. So we have to deal with our mental health. Um, I talk about um, our spiritual health. I don't care what you believe, what your, what your faith is. In this book, in chapter five, I talk about our spiritual health. And I'm talking about Tina Turner in this uh, particular chapter. I'm talking about me, but I'm also mentioning some other celebrities throughout this book that dealt with mental health, that, that dealt with uh, spirituality. And so one of the things, Tina Turner, we all remember that great movie, What's Love Got to Do With It? Um, Ike Turner was probably one of the worst abusers that I've ever met. One of the worst abusers that I've ever known. But yet Tina had to find her faith foundation. That was the strength that she gained to be able to uh, cope and deal and get away from Ike finally. She did everything. You go back and watch the movie. Every, she tried to love him. She tried to, uh, 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 you know, uh, hang in there with him despite. But it wasn't until she found her spirituality that she was able to gain this, this empowerment that she never had with him. She she gained such great empowerment. That was, that was the, I, am, I am, idea I thing that she needed, she needed to, leave to leave him. I want to ask you a question. I'm also, I'm also talking, talking about, about our financial, financial health. health. I hear feedback, I hear feedback Tiffany. Tiffany. Yeah, is, is, can you hear me? I can hear I you. I can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. So uh, I wanted to ask you a question, and I did hear you earlier. Thank you so much for the compliments. I appreciate that. Well, I, I was, and I'm, and I know you know my heart. Just in, in speaking, you know, tonight, and this is, uh, I don't mean to make light of it, though I'm a comedian, so there's going to be humor in everything for me. That's just how I deal with and cope with. That's my one of my coping mechanisms. But I was, I wanted to ask you this: when we talk about women such as Tina, and we know um, history of women that were in abusive relationships, and I can speak for myself. Like I said, when I realized that I was in an abusive relationship, should I say a physically abusive relationship, I got out of it. And I find myself, I get labeled as a runner because when it comes down to foolishness, see, I'm not the type of person to try to figure out stuff, trying to end. I'm that gut instinct. And I know, I know that I'm so connected to you. You see, spirit, spiritually, I understand what when spirits connect. So I'm so connected to you. I know something ain't right. And if it ain't me, it got to be you. So that's a short conversation. <laughs> when, But when it comes down to people that find themselves in these situations, it's almost as if they they seek them out. And, you know, I, I, I'm always puzzled by a person that's in a relationship. They're going through one thing. The person's going upside of the head or it's a jealous, a controlling relationship, maybe not even physical, it's just controlling, you know? And then the next thing I know is a new person they're involved with, but that person has the exact same tendencies, exact same traits. Like it, it, it what is it? Do you think is uh, an attraction that they're, that they, that they, that they go to these people repeatedly as, or even that they just keep coming back to the same one? What do you, how do, yeah. how do you mark yeah. that? So it's funny oh, it's that you funny mentioned that. You mentioned that, um, that um, because because in this book, I talk, I talk about, about that. that. So I refer, so to, I these refer people, to these people uh, that you're speaking of as leopards, right? So you heard the quote about a leopard stripes never change. They just change location. 
So you have to understand that this leopard, they're all, I also talk about vampires, uh, emotional vampires, uh, toxic vampires. When they no longer can feed off of you, when they have had almost enough of you because you've caught on to what they, who they are and what they're doing, and you're no longer serving their needs, that's why it's easy uh, for them to move on. So to answer your question is, um, people can tentatively tell uh, a weak person. And so I want to kind of break this down, right? So enough said, I see you as a respectable man. I see you as a man who's grounded, who's rooted. You know, I see you as a man who's stable. You know what you want. So when you naturally see a woman, you are keen, because men are hunters, okay? But you are keen in to know or recognize a strong woman versus a weak woman. Am I right or wrong? Am I right or wrong? Uh, to, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry, we have so, to mute each other. We have to mute so we don't get the feedback, but you're absolutely right, 100%. Absolutely, spot on. So me so, and so it's, it's all about, about, it's it's all about, about body, body language. language. It's, all, it's about all about perception. perception. And a man, and a man can, can pretty, pretty much, much tell, tell a woman, a woman who, is who is still broken. broken. And you want to know why? Because she still carries that stench on her. I can't explain it. I really honestly wish I could. But but it's almost like a dog can sniff. Oh, God. A dog can sniff fear. A dog can sniff fear. So, so to answer that, the reason why these abusers are able to move on to the, because you'll never find an abuser. And this is not to put anybody down because I was once a victim too. I thought I was, you know, everything in a bag of chips and pickles and all of that. But I found somebody to break me down. But this happens over time, uh, Nuff said. They are able to break their victim down by communication, by uh, 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 behavior patterns, patterns, by testing them, trying them. So let me say this. A person will test you, okay, whether uh, whatever they test you with. But when you fall for the bait, they it, it opens their innate system to say, oh, OK, she'll fall for anything. I can tell her anything. OK, uh, particularly like you said, when it happened, you left. OK, that that's not the case for all of us. A lot of us kept going back and a lot of us stayed longer than we should have. So what does that teach the abuser? See, what did they say? You teach people how to treat you. You teach people how to treat you. So the more you go back and the more you stay and the longer you stay, you're teaching them exactly how to treat you. And so that is how these abusers are able to keep moving from location to location to location because uh, they charm their way in. Um, they use all of these tactics, but they're testing their victim and they're seeing how much they can get away with and what they can tell them. And usually it's a bunch of lies. It's a lot of lies. But once you fall for it, it's like, oh, okay, I got I got another victim right here. Right. So, you know, you, you, you know, you're not really going to find uh, an abuser or I would say a weak abuser because to me, they're punks. Abusers are cowards. They're punks and they're not attracted. That's it. They're not attracted to uh, stabilized uh, women. They're not attracted to a woman who is a self-sufficient, independent, because, you know, a woman says, hey, I, I can hold my own. Not saying that I don't need you, but I don't have to have you because I can do it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but and if he feels time. like I can come in. Yeah. I, so I, so let me ask you this. So now we get we're getting this from uh, not to be sexist, but to play devil's advocate. And we're getting this from the woman's perspective. Is there a scenario where that same thing is applied where the woman is the one dominating the man this way? Is Absolutely. that, is, is, is that, I mean, I'm saying, is that, have you had instances of that? Do you know of anything of that? Or are we speaking just, you know, exclusively from the standpoint of the, the woman to the man, the man being the more dominant one? Cause like I said, in my situation, 
it was uh, my my then wife was she was fed up. I was fed up. My thought to it was to leave. So as I was leaving, I was attacked and assaulted. So I had never put my hands. I didn't even say a word to her. Literally didn't say a word because I had already tried to talk. So we're at a point where, okay, you're ignoring me. You know what? This is crazy. I'm tired of it. And again, that's me. That's my character. So I am a person that can say in a relationship, I love you enough to break my own heart. And yeah, we all go through that thing. But I know there's 22 days to take to form a new habit. So with that being said, if you're in a situation where you ain't happy, I'm not happy, and you're constantly yang, 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 none of that, hold on, hold on. We grown for. I'm 48. I know good and hell will. I ain't got that much time to go through this to get you to calm down to go. Th- I, I don't have that in me. So I need you to have your happiness as I have my own. And now we can come and share it. So you can't make nobody happy. I can't make you happy. And I think that's a lot of part of the problem. People feel like I got to make them happy if I don't make them happy or if you don't make me happy. No, that's not how it works. So again, and I get, I agree. Everybody isn't like me. Everybody doesn't have that mindset. Some people are hooked and you know, they, they stay stick and stay. Um, but I just, I just wanted to, I had to pause you because like I said, I was getting it from the woman's perspective, but I'm just wondering how often is it that you've even heard of it being from the man's perspective where he's the one being dominated by the woman? Well, again, he was going to share, um, I'm sorry. He was going to share his experience with us um, as as a man and being in an abusive relationship and dealing with, you know, toxic relationships. Um, But we do see it. And I know Jean can probably say it. I know Nicole can probably say it. Um, We were in the domestic violence shelter and we there was a man in there who had was in um, an abusive relationship. So we have over the years um, of being uh, survivors of being advocates, being speakers in the community. I know that I have. I've seen men that have um, admitted to me that they have been um, victims of domestic violence. But I think I can say across the board that when we when we speak of of abusers, for me, I'm not speaking of a gender. I'm speaking of a characteristics of an abuser, whether they're male or female. So when it comes to, you know, know, that's why I just wanted to say, that's why I said, and that's why when I opened up the show, I wanted to make sure everybody understand before we go to a gender, we have to remember that this is mental health. All this falls into mental health. Unfortunately, in the black community, we never discuss growing up mental health. It was always he acted funny. He's retarded. We had little names for pers- people, but it had to be like a physical thing with their mental health that we call them mentally ill. But they were people that we were raised by, people we love, our nana, our uncles, our moms, our dads, and even us suffering from mental health and not knowing it. Bipolarism. Um, the, the, the schizophrenia, um, the ADD, I'm talking about all different forms of mental health that tie into our stress and not to mention we're all surviving the pandemic. So I just didn't want to overtalk anyone, but I certainly wanted to point that out that this is, that, that was, that's why I asked that question and posed it the way that I did. I wanted to make sure that we understood that this wasn't just from the women, but it was also from the men. So it was more so again, go back to mental health. I thank everybody for all the comments. I enjoyed everybody. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Um, the other thing is you asked the question um, that said about um, why is it that that women, men, or whatever go back? Well, and so, I'll tell you from, from, from my perspective, my perspective is that, is that I felt, I felt that, that being in those toxic relationships and being in those relationships where I was being mistreated, um, it was what I knew. And it was something I didn't, my first relationship, relationship was not a healthy, not a healthy And so, and so I started with my relationship in my home with my father. My father, you know, at times would, would could be emotionally and, and verbally abusive. So when I was in relationships, you know, started my, my relationships, if someone was rude to me or disrespectful to me, it was what I had seen at home and what it was what I had seen, you know, between him and my mom or even, you know, him towards me. And so growing up in a family where I had parents who were not in a healthy marriage, that's that's what I knew. And so a lot of women, unfortunately, they come from 
um, a history of um, witnessing domestic violence in their homes or witnessing toxic relationships or witnessing unhealthy relationships as a child, whether it's male or female. And so that's all they know. So now you go out and you are, you attract or you are attracted to people that remind you of your father or remind you of mm -hmm. your mother. And mm -hmm. those are the kind of relationships that you, that you get in, unfortunately, until you learn that, those were not healthy relationships and that those are not the relationships that you want to mim mimic. And as my mom said to me the other, other day, we have to break the cycle. At some point we have to break the cycle. So um, from my perspective, that's why a lot of uh, victims um, continuously get into abusive relationships until they, until they realize because of their mindset, they finally realize that they do not have to be in this type of relationship and that, being in an unhealthy, toxic, abusive relationship is not normal, and that they don't have to continue that cycle. Um, Tiffany, I'm really glad you said that, that because that's that's what I was saying earlier. Is that um, you go? People go back to what's familiar, what's comfortable. Yes. So you know, I was mentioning that earlier. I know for me that was you know I going to a normal relationship after spending years in a toxic relationship is not normal. You don't adapt to that well. Yeah. You do not yeah. adapt to normalcy well. Right. So and this is why I have a guidebook easy. now to help people get back to a normal path, but it begins with self-love. You've got to go back. You've got to relearn because you've got to unlearn the toxicity right. and relearn what's normal and that begins with loving you. We've got to get back to self-love. That's very true. And That's very true. Can I add something? Mm -hmm. Oh, you can hear me? Oh, you, and <laughs> you know, with me, it was the opposite because I was so strong coming from New York. I had brothers, I had fathers, I had male, all, you know, I was the oldest. And so with me, it was, I was too strong and he was afraid I was going to leave him. So he, what he did, he secluded me from my family, then broke me down. And then I felt mm -hmm. after the relationship, I became weak. I was not that same person ever again. And I had to build that back up again. Mm -hmm. yep. Because That's I knew how my father treated my mom. And he, he, you know, he took care of us. He took care of her. I didn't see that. So I, when, I, when it first hit me, I was like, oh, no. And the more I got beaten, it's because I learned to fight back. And that's when it got worse. And that's how hard it was because mm -hmm. I just was fighting. Oh, you want to fight? Yeah, I'm going to fight you like a man too. So, you know, that's what I used to do with him until finally I had enough. You know, I can't fight. I'm not, well, I'm fighting for my life for, you know, right. I want the same love that my mother and them have that I'm used to seeing my aunts and them have. I want that same love too. Yeah. Enough yeah. said. Did you hear what Nicole said when she was mentioning how he broke her down? So now, that you, now you that you guys understand what I was saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. Well, an, 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 abuser, an abuser. Yeah, to what you're saying, I do understand that. Go ahead and break, break that, that, person down. that person down. Yes, I do understand exactly what you're saying. And the re I asked that question in two part, and you both gave it to me in a sense because I wanted to segue to something. And this is what I was getting at. So, for instance, I asked uh, when you mentioned Tina Turner, we were talking about Tina Turner and I asked, what is it about? Do, do you make, what makes this woman or this man feel like going back to the same relationship or the same thing or staying with it, et cetera, et cetera. So I asked that question. So then Tiff just broke down. Well, I came up out of a situation where my dad was that way. So then when I got into these other situations with these men, it, there was a sense of normalcy with that. So I get that. Now, the reason why I asked and I proposed that, and I wanted to open that up in the floor is because now I have a situation which is what brought me into this whole podcast and gave me the interest. I have a situation with my child. So she's in a situ a, a domestic violence situation. And I've tried to talk to her. I've tried to show her the whole family has. Now I wasn't that way. I've never raised her. I've never did. I've disciplined my kids, but I was never abusive. And I always taught them thunder and lightning don't make nothing grow. So I'm not the yelling dad. I'm the nursing dad. I'm the, let's talk about it. Dad. I'm like, you need to understand why you being disciplined type dad. And I'm that love that that's love is a verb dad. that's me. So when it comes down to seeing my kids in a situation where she got 
not only is she in a situation where it's another woman she's married to, but she's in a physically abusive. Now, in my opinion, I say it's two women fighting like women, two women. And that's what I say. But on the other side, I'm asking, what is the what what is the connect or what is the thing that's keeping you? to where you know this is how you were raised you this is how this is not how you love you understand that clearly so where and how did you develop this so then i heard you say well they break down and get them away from their people so i know that has happened and that's why i'm always forcing myself to make sure she understands look look i don't care what your choice is I'm here as a dad. I'm here as a father. And I love you regardless. And I don't want you to feel isolated. I'm not happy with your choice. I'm not happy with you being in this situation, but I'm still here with you. And the moment you say, dad, I need to do something different. I need to move. I'm with it. We with it. But again, I know that that return ticket is still there and it's happened over and over and over again. So you, you obviously got to let the, let the individuals make the choice for themselves. And again, that's something you pointed out so eloquently. And so I, I just wanted to, I wanted to bring all of that back full circles. Oftentimes the domestic violence may not be just us. It may be one of our loved ones that we love. It ain't nothing like seeing somebody hurt and broke up and you can't do a thing to help them, but send prayers, prayer go where we can't. And I'm going to tell you, that's what I use. So to anybody in that situation of that applies to you in your life, just know prayer go where we can't and you cannot box with God, neither can they. So that's that's my tool. That's what I use to defend it. Yeah. Other than that, yeah. Yeah. let me yeah. tell you, I'll be up a many nights crying and just yeah. ah, yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's good. That's and good. something and you something said earlier that, earlier that I love, you said, love that, said that, you know, you know um, um, people hurt people, you know. But I also, and Tiffany and, and Nicole and, and the others, please, you know, um, uh, jump in where you need to. But I have learned through training and I don't, well, let me just say this through my own personal experiences with the people I dealt with. I dealt with hurt people that hurt me. I tend to think that a lot of this was learned behavior, mm -hmm. but after going through domestic violence training, and I mean, uh, strenuous training, I learned that this is intentional behavior. Mm -hmm. People are making the choice to hurt you. Okay, so we can say mental illness in it, and it does. I, that is a culprit. There is some mental illness. There are some other childhood traumas, but it's almost you know when you when we were little and your mama said, "Now if you keep playing with that fire, mm -hmm. you keep going over there touching that stove, you're gonna get burnt." So it's it's a thing of knowing right and wrong. We all intuitively know when we do things right and when we're doing something wrong. And so when you look at an abuser or a perpetrator or whatever name you want to give them, they intuitively know what they are doing. Mm -hmm. They're making the choice to hurt people. So um, I, I love the way that you, you brought that to light as well. And so I want everybody to know uh, domestic violence is about power and control. Enough said when you talk about your daughter, uh, she has a person that is uh, that holds power over her, that's holding control. She's controlling everything. And she yeah. has the power to say or do uh, that controls just the, the environment that they're in. So that's a, like Nicole bought that um, vivid, valid uh, mm -hmm. uh, point up about isolation. That is one of the first things that uh, an abuser will do is they want to isolate you from your loved ones. So yep. what happens is once I isolate you from your loved ones, I can continue the abuse and you're not going to reach out to anyone. You've kind of pushed everybody to the side. They're no longer checking on you because mm -hmm. now, you know, they don't feel like you want their help anymore. And so we're just going to let her and him do what they do over there. Mm -hmm. So that's what the isolation isolation process is. That is to remove your support system, your loved ones, so that they can continue the abuse. And yeah. Kenya, and I, I just want to add, and part of me staying in is because of that, because I felt that I was more embarrassed to tell anybody that I was in it. You see what I'm saying? So they wouldn't expect yeah. me, oh no, not you. Oh, you so independent, oh, you so strong. And then I knew if I would have told anyone, my father, my brothers, one of them would have probably been in jail. 
-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so that is another reason I didn't tell them because I know my dad and I know my brothers, you know? Right. And I didn't, and I, I thought that he wasn't worth one of them going to jail or something happening to them. And then I would have had to live with that. So I, I stayed, made the choice to stay in until I spoke out and told everybody, especially my mom and my aunt, those are the women that helped me get out. Good for you. And I, and I would probably say this the same as well. Um, I was isolated um, uh, to the point where my parents wouldn't even come and see me. They didn't, you know, if I went over there, he would constantly call me every time I left out the house. And so I ended up getting to the point where I didn't even want to go anywhere because I was embarrassed because they called me every five minutes. Um, and they, they, they did, it just got, it was really bad. It was really bad where I just really didn't have anyone else to call because either the people were, you know, they were sick of him. <laughs> they were sick of the relationship <laughs> and, uh, you know, they were, sick of me not not doing what I needed to do to um, to be safe um, or I pushed them away because I wasn't disclosing and I wasn't telling them anything but they knew that something was wrong um, so isolation is definitely one of the first things that's that happens when someone is um, is an abuser or is um, is you know has ill intentions to, against you they're going to isolate you because once they isolate you, then they 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 can they can continue breaking you down um, because now you have nobody to turn to. Um, so that is that's um, when I spoke earlier about you know the name calling and and the the controlling you where you go what you do what you wear so forth and so on. The the another another sign of um, of abusive relationships is the isolation definitely and unfortunately um, the LGBTQ um, community is not is not uh, oblivious to mm -hmm. domestic violence. Uh, the LGBTQ community has a very high rate of, of domestic violence. Um, and it's unfortunate when you have um, two women, two, two whomevers that are, that are fighting and one is um, controlling over the other, um, it, it, it breaks your heart. And I can't imagine if my child was going through that. Um, but yeah. what I can say to you enough is that Keep letting her know that you are present. Yes. Yes. Keep yes. letting her know yes. that you love her and keep yes. letting her know that when she is ready, that you are there. Um, because yes. there is, hopefully there will come a time where she will feel the love from you and she will know that she has a safe place to go. So don't give up on yes. her. Even though yes. I know you won't, yes. but some, some people do. Some family members, they say they, they're going to wash their hands and, so forth and so on that happens. And then the next thing you know, your loved one is, is has been has been killed and now they're a statistic. So mm -hmm. keep letting her know that yep. you're there, keep letting her know that you are aware, and keep letting her know that when she is ready, that you are gonna be there. Um we oh, are uh, you, you are gonna go without I'm a present father, so I promise you my my middle my <laughs> baby girl is nineteen and then the others the one that I'm speaking to her, she's twenty five and then twenty six is the daughter above her. So I don't I don't play about my kids. That's not male or female. I mean I tell my son the same thing. I must had a son. My son came to my uh, middle, my middle boy and he was like, Yo, dad, I had a situation. I hey bro, you gotta get right, man. You cannot be caught up if she's testing you, make you feel like that ain't no such thing if she made me do it. Oh right, man, right. leave. Get, get, and now he's in a whole matter of fact he's married. Man. He's married, he's doing well, he loves his wife, his wife loves him. And um I don't know. That's just, uh, just I don't know. It just that just puzzled me. I, there's no answer to it per se. We know this is life. We get it. So, but I just I don't mind sharing, and I certainly I should not just just to share my story with her. But I'm vocal about that because I'm 100. When I tell you if I get a phone call, I gotta go. I gotta go do what I gotta do, and I'll be where I need to be. But that's just that's just my love for my kids, and I think anyone on this line probably share the same sentiment. Um, in that regard, but I'm very vocal about it, and she knows I feel. Everybody knows, old family knows. So I don't, I don't, I don't miss words about that. And I know there are other parents out there struggling with the same thing that I'm dealing with. So I know I'm not alone. I ain't crazy. I ain't by myself. No matter what you go through in life, always remember that you're not alone. You're not crazy. You're not by yourself. That's it. That's right. That's right. Um, um, I, 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 you can hold on for a second, and I'm going to share a cut. 
Um, Miss Erica is a poet and she is going to close us out. But what I would like is for Miss Iris to say a prayer before we get for, before we get off for all of those out there who are in abusive relationships and um, also for uh, Nufstead's daughter that she um, finds the strength to get out of her abusive relationship. So Erica, thank you for being patient with us and being here while we're talking about domestic violence because it is an ugly truth. Domestic it violence is. is ugly. It's deadly. Mm -hmm. It's a plague. It's a pandemic. It's an epidemic. It's all of those things. It's a social it is. issue in our community in every race, it is. in every age, and unfortunately. I'm just stepping away from it. So I'm just stepping away from it just stepping yeah. away, literally. So yeah, it's a big deal and, and it needs to be spoken about. It needs to be brought to the forefront. Um, my father was my culprit. Uh, it started from a young age mm -hmm. um, to me and my mother. So, and it, he's a narcissist. It just continues. It just, it continues. So I recently, um, gotten away so to say so it hasn't even been a month yet <clears throat> so yeah thank you I yeah i know that you were going through um something pretty intense the last couple of um months that we have been talking so i'm very grateful that you decided to come on with us tonight um at the last minute i felt it in my heart that um i needed you present and so that's why i checked in with you again um, to have you um, on tonight because I felt Thank I felt you. something wasn't sure what it was but now I know because you just yes, you just yes. let us know what it was yes, so um, you. you are very welcome Miss Erica so the floor is yours uh, sweetheart what would you like to share it's, with us tonight um, well it's a poem um, and I call it Father's Choice. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, your pride, your joy, your only daughter, your words hurt more than the slaps to the face. Your lack of respect stabs my heart. Your lies wound my soul, dampen my spirit, allowing me to accept way less than I deserve in all areas of my life. You were supposed to be my goat, my lifeline to a greater man, an example of the choice of a man that's worthy of me and all that I have to offer. You were to support career choices in my life, not yours. Whatever you missed in your life has nothing to do with the choices I make in mine. Your physical, verbal, and emotional abuse have affected all areas of my life and the choices I've made. I've struggled to try to make you proud of me. Instead, there was no pride, no support, no unconditional love, just ridicule. Words to tear down my soul and spirit. I'll try no more. You no longer exist to me. I must save myself. Rid me of all toxins and toxic people. It's unfortunate for you. You've truly lost out on a beautiful daughter inside and out. You've missed her growth into maturity, into womanhood. Thank you for the strength you gave. Thank you for showing me the type of parent and person not to be. Thank you for showing me how love is not supposed to be. You may have a nice house and a nice neighborhood, you may drive a nice SUV. You may have a nice bank account with a good income. But what I have are more riches than your eyes can see and your mind can obtain. I'm genuine. I'm caring, loving, generous. I'm good to those that are good to me. Those that aren't, I leave alone. I take ownership for my mistakes and faults. I apologize with sincerity, making sure not to make the same mistakes. I fear God and his truth his power, his forgiveness, his mercy and grace, his protection, his love. Because of this, I'm unmeasurably wealthy. So my questions to you are, how wealthy are you really? And where do you stand with your God? Yeah, I felt that. Yes, um, yes. I that definitely true. felt that. That. Mm -hmm. that took me a year to write because I needed wow. it. I needed it. There's so much anger still. Um, and I needed it to turn out in a positive. I needed to turn it around. I needed to make sure that the end was more positive even than where I currently am. So yeah, it took me about a year to write that. 
Yeah, I understand. I I can definitely understand what you just wrote, um, and I am so glad that you um, were able to come on tonight. Like I said, I, something was pulling me to you, Eric. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was. Thank you. But I now I know. That. Um, yes, we're kindred sisters. We've we've yeah. uh, experienced some of the same things. So, and I'm sure that um, Irish and Nicole, we can all say to you that we are here for you. We understand, yes. and your journey has begun. Your journey has yes. begun. Um, yes. I'm ready for it. I'm ready. Yes. For it. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Before we get off and before Miss Irish ends us out with a prayer, I usually don't do spiritual religious things um, on my platform, but I feel that it's necessary tonight for Nuff said, um, for his daughter, for you, um, but also those who um, are watching right now and who will watch in the, in the future. Um, I just think it's really important for us to end this, um, this panel because domestic violence, it is a, it's a very ugly, ugly thing. Um, and receiving it from a parent sets children up the worst. for, yes, the for worst. disaster in relationships. And it can be really tough. It can be really tough. And so I'm so proud of you for taking the time to write that, whether it was a year or whether it was a month. You wrote it, you did it, and um, you are on your way. Um, you. I wanted to let everybody know I'm working on a book right now, uh, Earn Your Wings, A 30-Day Journey from Survivor to Advocate. And it's sharing um, not only my experiences, but those of others. And just, um, it's going to be a resource for people like you, Erica, who um, are survivors and are, they're now ready to take the next step to advocacy. It'll be released um, on October 31st on, uh, on Kindle. Again, it's Earn Your Wings. You can pre-order it now on Amazon. Um, you can also pre-order it, the uh, paperback version on my website, tiffanylbrown.com. Um, I wanna thank each and every one of you for coming on tonight, for sharing your stories, Miss Irish, Miss Nicole, um, mm -hmm. Nuff said for co-hosting, it looks like we lost him. Um, mm -hmm. Also to John A. Wright for coming on and sharing her song with us. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I am, I'm honored. I'm honored as always to have all of you. And Miss Erica, I'm definitely going to be reaching out to you so you can start. Thank you. The, the, you can start your journey with the support, with the, with support, because all oh, of us needed you. support. Yeah. We were, thank you. And we and still need support. No, yeah. no matter how long we've been doing this, whether it's 20 years, whether yeah. it's eight years, whether it's five years, you're always going to need support. And you have a sisterhood and a brotherhood right here waiting for you to embrace yeah. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You are very welcome. Miss Irish, can you go ahead and close us out with a prayer? Yes, yes. Um, Tiffany, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I know that you had a rough weekend, but I do thank you for your commitment and dedication to advocacy uh, yeah. for domestic violence. So thank yes. you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Heavenly Father, once again, God, we come before you full of gratitude. God, we thank you for this opportunity to come on the uh, platform tonight in the private room with Tiffany Brown, God, to share our testimonies, to be an enlightenment to those who may or may not be in the trenches of domestic violence. But before I even go into the prayer request, Tonight, God, I just want to thank you for what you're doing in Tiffany's life. Father God, I want to thank you that you touched her while she was laying in the hospital over the weekend, God. Father God, I want to thank you for the uh, them being able to clear her from the hospital so that she could get home to her family, even in her weakness, and still do what she does for the community, God. So, Lord God, I just ask that you touch Tiffany right now, God. Touch her in her body, God. Continue to heal Tiffany, God. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, as we come tonight, Lord God, we're praying for every man, woman, boy and girl that may be experiencing domestic violence or any kind of violence 
any kind of mental illness, any kind of suicidal thoughts, God. Lord God, you are the author and the finisher of all things, God. Father God, you are our creator. Lord God, the word says that you knew us even before we were in our mother's womb. So God, you know us. You created us. So God, I ask right now that you just step into the midst of the, those that are struggling mentally, those that are struggling uh, spiritually, God, those that are struggling financially, those that are just struggling what to do right now, God, at this very moment. Lord God, we're asking your spirit to just come in, almighty God, and take over, God. We send Satan back to the pit of hell from which he belongs. Yes. He does not have access to your children, God. So, Lord, I'm asking you to touch every situation tonight. I'm asking you to touch every relationship tonight. But God, what I'm asking in the midst of this podcast, God, is that you protect your people on tonight, God. Protect them from the hands of the abuser on tonight, God. Lord God, I'm asking that you make a way of escape for each and every person that wants to escape, God, that has been praying and that has been seeking and asking you for a way out. God, open doors tonight. God, open windows tonight. God, send help tonight. God, make a way of escape tonight, God. Keep your hands on your people, God, on your children, God, like never before, God. Lord God, we're calling out to you. We're crying out to you, God, for it's your help that we seek. And we know that if you don't do it, God, it can't be done. So, God, there is nothing impossible with you. There is nothing too hard for you, God. And this is according to your word. There is nothing too hard for you, God. So, God, I'm asking that you step in and make it easy on them tonight, God. Lord God, for those of us that have survived and overcome, God, we know what it's like to be in those trenches. We know what it's like to be in those dark moments of depression. We know what it's like to be in the midnight hour and not knowing what the next day is going to be, God. What the next hour is going to be, God. But Lord, just like you delivered us, just like you saved us, God, we're asking that you do it for those people tonight, God. The people that are crying out and calling out to you, what must I do, God, to be saved? How can I escape this situation, God? Make a way, God. Mm -hmm. You are a way maker. Make a way for them, God. It is in the name of Jesus and every parent that is worried about a child tonight, Mm -hmm. every parent that is stressed out and and, and not knowing and uncertain of what to do, God, give them clarity, God. Give them clarity how to help their children tonight, God, like only you can. It is in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for being on. Frozen.